Michiganders can be a superstitious bunch. We find all sorts of reasons to explain the world around us, sometimes pulling from science, sometimes tradition, and sometimes from our imaginations. What happens when we can't readily explain our experiences? And what happens when a ghost story gets out of hand? Do these legends stem entirely from fantasy? Or are people seeing things no one can truly explain? I'm Krista K. Coburn. And I'm Kay Gray. Welcome to Haunted Mitten. Season 3, baby! Woo! All right. Uh, hello, Michigans. Welcome to season three. Before we get into today's topic, we have an email to share with you because, oh my God, we got mail. We did. We keep asking you to send us mail and someone actually did. Thank we you. Find it. it took a while, but <laughs> we got it. <laughs> hello, Haunted Mitten. Born and raised you for here, reaching out to share with you more insight to the Paulding Lights. So my name is Justina, and I was born in Marquette with both parents, genuine Youpers. My mother grew up in Berglund, Michigan, which is about 30 miles east of Paulding. Okay, so that's good to know, because there's a lot of little towns up there. (laughs) I don't know where any of them are. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) After listening to your episode on the Paulding Light, I got curious and asked my parents if they ever saw it. My mom did see it when she was a kid. Had to be the 80s. She was born in 75. The following is her true story experiencing this phenomenon. I was just a kid when my friend and I went to investigate the light everyone has been talking about. When we got there, we saw the light immediately, and it just looked like a big circular light in the distance, like a starlight or moonlight, but close to the earth. No strobe effect. The colors stayed the same bright white. The position stayed the same, and the brightness stayed the same. We followed the train tracks to see if we could reach the source, and the entire time we were walking, we could see the light off in the distance. After walking for some time down the tracks, all of a sudden the light just disappeared. We turned around to look and see where it went, and there it was, behind us. It looked to be the exact same distance as it was in front of us, but now it was behind us. So there were, in fact, railroad tracks there, but she's not sure when they were removed. She definitely followed train tracks to find the light when she was there in the 80s. As for the legend, my mother heard this one. There was a railroad brakeman that that was lost and got killed by a train on the tracks the light is him still trying to find his way perhaps this was a mix between the two most common legends anyways i hope you find this insight interesting to your research thank you for sharing your wonderful haunted mitten stories in your podcast you can count on this you for turning in every week thanks justina awesome thank you thank you and then she goes on to talk about um another place in the up that we're gonna have to talk about later so you don't get to know (laughs) So thank you, Justina. We appreciate you liking and listening and sending us mail. Tell us everything you know about spooky UP stuff. Yeah, we would like to go back and do another tour. Yes. Yeah, because I've only been there once and it was a very quick, (laughs) a very quick turnaround. Yeah, I've been a a few times, but yeah. But not like, like we only did the spooky thing once. Like we haven't gone yeah. up to be like, let's go explore, you know, all this haunted shit. <laughs> all right. Well, shall we? Yeah, let's let's get, get into to it. Yeah, today's topic. So located near the southernmost curve of Saginaw Bay on Lake Huron, Bay City has a seedy past. So seedy, in fact, that this is going to be another two-parter. Heck yeah. I can't wait to get into this. Oh, it's so good. Like, okay, maybe seedy isn't the appropriate word for all the stories but wild definitely is bay city was first settled by europeans in 1837 and incorporated as a city in 1865 the big industries quickly became lumbering milling and shipbuilding for the first few decades bay city meant only the city on the east bank of the saginaw river the west bank was west bay city formed as a village in 1871 The two merged in 1905, becoming the city that we know today with a population of roughly 33,000. Living, that is. 
So here's where it gets fun. Back in the lumbering days, the strip of Water Street between Center and Third Streets was known as Hell's Half Mile. In the early spring, after the lumbermen had finished felling Michigan's massive, beautiful pine trees. Thanks a lot. Um, or, yeah, I've seen them. They're beautiful. Go look. Um, so about, about a thousand men um, would flock to this district of road and its bars, brothels, dance halls, other entertainments, both legal and illegal. There were tunnels that ran beneath the streets connecting the businesses. So they were a great way to travel unseen. Or hide a body. Or hide a body. Uh, things things got easily out of hand in Hell's Half Mile and brawls were common. This like this already sounds like it's Portland or Seattle. Wait, what has the underground? Um, Seattle did. Seattle. We did the tour where Greg saw a ghost. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So brawls were common, as were arrests, you know, after you have the brawl. And where do you put people that you've arrested? The local jail. Located just a block away at 814 Saginaw Street, the old city hall was built around 1862 and also housed the city jail. Lisa Hoskins, in her book, Ghosts of Bay City, Saginaw, and Midland, says that a prostitute named Emily, or M for short, is thought to have killed herself in the jail. Great. <laughs> yes, she has a very brief account. Yeah. <laughs> I just, like, remember, folks, that when we write these scripts, one of us has written this script and done the research, and the other person... <laughs> usually doesn't know what's going to be said oh, <laughs> so, I was like, so i was reading along says that a prostitute named emily blah, 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 thought to have killed herself in the all right cool cool yeah. thanks for that thanks that, that's all and this actually will become important later that is all that she includes in her book okay nicole beauchamp thank you for giving me the pronunciation <laughs> in her book haunted bay city michigan offers more details she says the woman's name was Emmeline, a.k.a. Canada M. Yeah. Great name. <laughs> she was a prostitute and thrown in a detention center, detention cell in the building's basement, the, the jail. You know, where do you put a jail? The basement. You can't really Obviously. get out of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> she had a catatonic fit and the authorities thought that she died, thought she died and buried her. Her boyfriend, however, who was called Bay City Bart. Oh my God. Yeah, it's great. I love the story. Right. Okay. All right. <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a name. Yep. Uh, suspected they had sent her body to the University of Michigan's medical school and he dug up the grave to check. Her hair was in disarray and claw marks were found on the inside of the coffin's lid. lid. Canada M was buried alive. Now it is said that her ghost wanders the restaurant in a, a quote, an elegant red ball gown so that's horrifying but okay yes I, I couldn't find anything confirming this story as I often say on this podcast um and, and I I question this a little bit because so Hoskins book and Beauchamp's book Beauchamp's book actually just came out last year um they're published 10 years apart um so if there was an incident as sensational as Canada M's uh, I, I would have expected Hoskins to have included more details but she didn't. She just gave us prostitute named M died. Mm, yeah. So it's a great story. I, I really like Beauchamp's book because she clearly relishes telling a good story. And she, she does tell some good ones. But just, you know, Canada M, Bay City Bar, <laughs> buried alive. Like that would have caused a stir. Uh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> great like story. That would have been a big deal. <laughs> And you've got the added detail of the University of Michigan's medical school because there were scandals back then of people stealing bodies and selling them to U of M's medical school. Oh, yeah. So great little details, but I, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the books were written 10 years apart. I guess more things could have been digitized in that time, making it easier for Beauchamp to find articles, maybe? It could be. And well, both women did their research. I won't say maybe yeah, one did yeah, yeah. the other, but I don't know. I just really question this one. I, I would like to know where Beauchamp got, got this from. Yeah, that would, uh, yes. I would love, if, like, if there are old news articles, like, please, we want them. We love them. Yeah. And I, I tried and I couldn't, 
couldn't find it. The only things I found online were probably the same source she had because it was, it wasn't word for word, but the stories were very similar. The nicknames were the same. Yeah. And, and that source didn't cite their source either. So no, great. <laughs> it, just, it sounds to me like a, a legend that then kind of grew and it got more details as the decade went by. Like it's a great story, I, I, but yes, I, I really love, uh, Canada M and her boy toy Bay City Bart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more details in, in the books. This is me just summarizing them, but uh, right. on that, like this, this block or a few blocks of the city were just absolutely wild out of hand, all kinds of crimes happening. One story we could verify also seems pretty sensational, but there are newspaper articles to back this one up. Uh, Krista had found a newspaper article, but then couldn't find it again later, as is the joy of the internet. So for this, we made use of the Ann Arbor District Library's Contact Us page, where you can submit reference questions online. The amazing and wonderful Darla, hello Darla, from the archives, got back to us with newspaper clippings and other links that not only confirm the story, but give us a little backstory as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Darla. Darla plus, 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 plus. <laughs> Yay, library inside, inside jokes. jokes. <laughs> Um, yes, well, while we do work in a library, um, neither one of us went to school for it. Nope. So nope. I, I do occasionally run into walls when I'm trying to track something down. And this was just way too interesting a story to not try to figure out. And I promise you, it's 100% real. <laughs> promise you. <laughs> I can't wait because I have no idea what the story is. Yeah. In the show notes, I have included links. <laughs> Go on. So Dolores Dolly Valesita Hill was born on May 10th, 1877, either in Spain or Mississippi. I know these are two very different places. Okay. Um, yeah. On her death certificate, the place of birth is listed as Mississippi, um, as well as her mother's. They list mother and mother's place of birth. And that is also Mississippi. But an article in Variety in 1920 says she was living in Natchez, Mississippi, raising Shetland ponies before turning to a new career in circus and vaudeville. So she was at least living okay. there in 1920. I'm already I'm telling you, this is a good story. Okay, I'm already in it. Like, yes, I'm, I'm about it. Shetland oh, yeah. ponies, circus, done. Oh yeah. But her father um, is listed on the death certificate as unknown and elsewhere, different sources list her birthplace as Spain. So her father could have been Spanish, maybe. Maybe her, her mother was from Mississippi. I, I don't know. She could have been born in Spain, moved back to her mother's hometown in Mississippi. Okay. But when she performed in Luna Park in 1908, she's listed in a newspaper clipping from that time as Mademoiselle Velocita and is said to be French. And right. another newspaper that she performed, um, said she performed under the name Dora Valiseda with a D, not a T. And yet another newspaper article said she performed under Dolores Valiseda. So who knows? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's show business for you, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you do look her up, there will be different names. You'll find different names and, and, yeah. and different information. But she yeah. did exist. She did exist, folks. And we actually know quite a bit about her. Yeah, but I'm sure that's part of what made this such a difficult story to like track down. Yes, it did. So many names. Yep. If you head to her page on Find a Grave, one of our favorite websites, you can read this all in more depth. But to summarize, Dolly eventually started an international touring animal act called Valacita's Leopards. This is going to end great. In which five or six trained leopards rolled globes, seesawed, formed a pyramid, posed for pictures, and played bells and chimes while Dolly accompanied them on piano. She married an animal broker. That just... I know what it is, but like, it's weird. Yeah, that's weird. You're just buying a trade in on Wall Street, but it's lions. She married an animal broker named Arthur Hill from New York, but he doesn't seem to have been with her in Bay City in 1925. There are pictures, by the way, online in, I, in the things that Darla found that show pictures of the leopards. Oh, yeah. Go to the show notes and see Aww. if you can follow some links. Some of them are on ProQuest. So, you might need to be in a library or need to log in to view them, but there it's out there. It's out there, folks. So in 1924, Dolly rented the then vacant old city hall where she was training her leopards. One newspaper from the time said that she'd been there for at least two months. 
and the poli- police denied knowing about it. It, it that's all it says and the police denied okay. knowing about it. like uh did okay. they have to okay that's fine yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh many people were surprised that the leopards would be allowed given that the building is right in the middle of downtown <laughs> um and and it could have been disastrous if one of the cats had escaped so i suppose that's why the police maybe should have been made aware um but unfortunately tragedy was in the cards but not for bay city citizens i'll let Kay read from the front page of the detroit free press from january 10th 1925 oh goody oh no pat leopard attacks girl animal trainer i'm not gonna do the 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 mid-atlantic voice but imagine it in that voice (laughs) Yes. Uh, she had turned her back for a second when the leopard sprang on her, landing with his paws and teeth on the back of her neck and knocking her to the floor. The infuriated animal continued to choke and paw the woman and gradually moved his hold on her neck to the throat. She managed, however, to attract the attention of Herbert Craig of Bay City, who had been assisting her. Craig was in the rear part of the building and after hearing her scream, secured an iron bar. Springing into the arena through one of the two doors, he securely fastened them and, watching his chance, advanced to where the animal had the woman on the floor. He succeeded in striking the leopard over the head several times. The blows dazed the brute for a moment, and then it left the woman and sprang at Craig, like you do. He again clubbed it over the head until it walked away, and Craig then seized Mrs. Hill and removed her from the cage. The animal succeeded in puncturing Mrs. Hill's windpipe with its teeth and disfiguring her face. His claws also dug into her scalp and her face was badly scratched. Hence the disfiguring. Yep. Good God. So actiony. Yeah. Like I said, quite a bit of information is known about this. Uh, the Battle Creek Inquirer reported on January 13th, 1925, that Dolly died from her injuries. It also said that this was a new cat that had been recently added and that Dolly had been in the animal training business for over 25 years. Oof. Like other more recent stories, uh, or recent sources such as mybaycity.com say that the cat had been giving her an affectionate hug that turned deadly, but the sources from that time definitely state otherwise, as we just heard. Dolly was inexplicably buried in Bay City without a headstone. Her husband, yeah, her husband came to town for the service, but then left without taking care of the stone. So he wasn't with her. He, I believe, he was in New York this whole time. An entry on mybaycity.com from October seventeenth, twenty ten, tells of how the Elmlawn Cemetery, where Dolly is buried, placed its own stone. "Quote: They marked her grave with a granite stone featuring not only her name and birth and death date, but also an engraving of a leopard's head." And you That's can see that messed up. You can see that on Find a Grave. I believe there's a picture of that. Yeah. What a story, huh? Okay. So it's really that's like somebody getting stabbed to death and you put a knife. <laughs> I mean, she did spend her life for the most part, as far as we can tell, working with these animals. But yeah, I thought it was kind of strange at first because that's how she died, but also that's how she lived. So I don't know. I, I kind of wonder how she felt about being killed by one of the cats. Yeah. And I think a lot of the reason a lot of more recent tellings of it say that it was a beloved cat is because they want to like tug at your heartstrings like, oh, it was a beloved cat and it was trying to give her a hug, but it was deadly when like it doesn't sound like at the time from sources from 1925 kind of say the opposite. It was a new cat. It wasn't well trained. She was working with it and it's lashed out at her. Right. Which I feel and I know nothing about training big cats, but I'm like, that seems legit. Like that seems a lot more likely. Like, yeah, this sucks. This is a really bad accident. Yeah. It's really horrible. And, and kudos to Mr. Craig for uh, being able to get her out of there. It's a wild story. And I first encountered it in one of the books. I think it might've been Hoskins book. And in that one, it said it was a, a woman or a, an animal trainer had two tigers and, Mm when her assistant went to feed the cats, one of them attacked her. And that was the story I kept hearing. And that's why I couldn't find it is because they weren't tigers. They were leopards. Right. Okay. So, and I tried like big cats, but I I didn't then go through the list of big cats (laughs) in order to find it. Right, right, Uh, right. And Darla was like, I'm sharing this with the archives team because we love wild history stories. And this is great. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) 
Yeah, there's a lot happened in in Bay City back in the day because it was a huge, huge port. It was very important for for lumber, for milling, for shipping. Now, because we, you know, we're kind of out of the heyday of shipping on the Great Lakes. It just seems like this small town, but right man it has a wild history animal trainers lady getting killed by a leopard oh my gosh i'm looking at the pictures now on find a grave and there's one of her with a leopard in like all dolled up in her like circus outfit that leopard looks pissed and greg had never heard of her and he was surprised because he's so into circus history oh yeah Um, and, and michigan does have quite a bit of circus history but that one he'd never come across so i'll have to share all of this with him oh there's a lovely portrait of her And four of her leopards, they're all in like their own little bubbles. And she's in the middle and she's like centered, looking all badass. And her leopards are just like, hey, we're big cats. What's up? She was quite the celebrity in her day. Yeah. Yeah. She toured the world. I mean, she was interviewed by, you know, big name magazines that we, they're still around today. (laughs) Right. So yeah, we, we do know quite a bit about her because she was very famous and did tour the world and was featured in newspapers and magazines and things, but she's not very well remembered. Well, we will remember you, Dolly. Absolutely. And I'm really glad that that uh, the cemetery got together and, and put up a headstone because- Oh, me too. Because my God, for her to have been so big and to have died in such a way and then to not even have a headstone, that's awful. I like how her husband was like, oh yeah, I'll be at the funeral, but like, I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> what the heck, man? Eh, they, they obviously, you know, they were living in separate areas. So there's that. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe it wasn't uh, the happiest of marriages. It might not have been. I didn't find as much info on him. Okay. With those two stories out of the way, what goes on at Old City Hall? Because a lot of stuff has happened there. Uh, Well, Ghosts of Bay City, Saginaw, and Midland by Lisa Hoskins, as well as a newspaper article from last year posted on MLive called Local Eats, Old City Hall's Ghost Stories, and Revolving Menu Keep Patrons Coming in Bay City. Uh, each report that table 14 specifically is thought to be haunted. Lumps of coal will appear on the table out of thin air. The newspaper article also states employees hear weird noises at night. Lights will flicker. All those sorts of ghost story things. And that is a quote. Oh, yes. That's why I put it in there. <laughs> All those sorts of ghost story things. Yeah, You know, that ghost stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But how that relates to an alleged prostitute and an animal trainer, I have no idea. Nope. (laughs) No. Like, yeah, some crazy stuff apparently has happened in this building, but nah, Cole. Yeah, it's it's strange. And and um we will definitely be going here (laughs) to have dinner or something. We are hundred percent eating at this restaurant. And I'm gonna be like, please tell me table 14 is free. I will wait. Nope. So by the time this by the time this gets posted, we'll we will have been there. But yes, as of recording, we have not been there yet. Right. That. But all those sorts of ghost story things, like <laughs> yeah, how but you want to that ghosty stuff, you know, you know, like ghost shit, whatever. <laughs> cool. You want to tell me what that is? Like, yeah, when we go there, we'll have to look out for ghost stuff. I guess. <laughs> Man, it's a good thing that we're like paranormal researchers because otherwise. <laughs> we wouldn't know if a haunting slapped us in the face goodness all right yeah (laughs) moving a few blocks further away from hell's half mile we're still downtown you will find the scottish Rite masonic center and the historic masonic temple they are two separate but connected buildings from what it looks like on google maps i looked at this thing from all angles they seem to be connected and that's what people seem to indicate when they talk about them they do kind of use these terms interchangeably so it was a little confusing we'll be visiting this place too (laughs) yes so they they do they have different addresses so they are two separate entities but they do take up the same city block so it's all right there the valley of michigan scottish rights website describes the scottish right as quote one of the branches of freemasonry in which a master mason may proceed after he has completed the three degrees of symbolic or craft masonry sure i hope that means something That's got to mean something to somebody. Yeah, I went over this so many times and I was like, okay, I think I get it. (laughs) I do. We we do have a friend who's a Mason. We can. We do. I'll ask. (laughs) Yeah, it's really cool. The Freemasonry is very interesting to me. But so uh, Chris Sova, who is a past master and current secretary of Joppa Lodge, 
that was what I found when I looked it up. The okay. internet told me it was pronounced Joppa. Um, it's Joppa Lodge number 315, or he was at least of 2019. I assume he still is, don't know. Um, but he explains in a Route Bay City article entitled The Not-So-Secret History of Bay City's Masonic Temple, quote, Freemasons are not a secret society. It's a society with secrets. Uh... <laughs> I, I do like no, that. I have no it's idea. a society of secrets. <laughs> I do like that because yeah, it's it's no longer a secret society. You can't right. We we know yeah a fair amount about them. Like I said, we know someone who's a Freemason. Right. So. Like he like he was allowed to tell me that. <laughs> right. Uh, the first building on this site with glorious onion domes, and I know that sounds terrible, but trust me, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It was, was built in 1893. Sadly, it was devastated by a fire 10 years later. The copper that was recovered was melted down and made into coins as mementos, which you can see on display today. Sure, because that's what you, that's just, that, that building's gone. Fuck it. Make a coin. Yeah, apparently it was like, it was mostly destroyed. You can see Oof. pictures too in, in the books. The building was rebuilt in 1905 to be more fire resistant. Like you do. In 2005, it was saved from demolition by the Bay Arts Council, then later taken over by the Friends of the Historic Masonic, which is taken on the task of reservation. Inside is a cathedral-like theater and a vintage barbershop. Today, the space is often used as a wedding venue. Nicole Beauchamp says in her book that it was built atop an old cemetery and that bodies were moved, which is, you know, always a great idea, to Oak Ridge Cemetery before the building was constructed. However, we found a vintage map of Bay City from 1867 of this city block, and it doesn't show a cemetery. We also emailed the Bay County Historical Society, and Jamie got back to us saying, quote, in our insurance maps and a quick search in the local newspapers only shows me a house at 614 Center. In 1906, to the west of that lot was empty, uh, besides an outbuilding of some sort. I do not see anything mentioning a cemetery at that location. Uh, unquote much thanks to jamie for that info if you ever need information about you know your local area always contact your historical society they know everything yep cemeteries definitely have been moved to make room for city expansion San, San francisco being a famous example but we couldn't find this one i don't know where beauchamp found this if you do or you are beauchamp please email us at contact hauntment ha I can't ever say our email right. My mouth does not make these words. <laughs> You're the one who came up with it. I did. What's wrong <laughs> with me? Um, if you do know, if you are Nicole Beauchamp, we want to know too. Please email us at contacthauntedbitten at gmail.com. Yeah, I've listened to a number of interviews with her and she sounds pretty cool. Like, like we could get a drink and talk about ghosts. That'd be great. Oh. Like, basically, if you research ghosts, we want to be your friend. That's just. Yeah, especially people <laughs> who do, like, deep dives into their home cities, because obviously they're passionate about that. And right. yeah, I, it'd be super fun. Yeah. We can sit down at table 14, see if a lump of coal shows up. So, so meet us all at table 14 <laughs> in Bay City. <laughs> we'll buy you a drink. We'll talk about some ghosts. We'll, we'll maybe get some coal like we're bad children at christmas it'll be good times yeah so the the previously mentioned uh, route based city article contains the line and i love this and if you believe such things the building is haunted thanks <laughs> so blase all these newspaper articles oh my god this is an online news news not really newspaper but news source so the place has a reputation <laughs> <laughs> i guess you know. Uh, as all of these places do, obviously. Beauchamp includes several in her book. So her book is great. She has a lot of pictures too. So you can see those glorious onion domes and some of the old pictures and you can see the what the barbershop look. It looks like a barbershop. Um, no way. Like, like an old timey barbershop. And it's, it's used as the bridal suite today. So a bride waiting in the barbershop and they do sometimes call it the costume room or the bridal suite. Because that's what they use it for now. She saw... Quote, an older gentleman in a suit and glasses standing in the darkened tunnel that abuts the bridal suite. She walked up to him curiously. Is everything okay? She asked. He looked at her with adoring eyes and smiled sweetly. Oh, darling, he began. You look positively beautiful. 
She was just about to thank him when he disappeared before her eyes, end quote. And many brides have had similar encounters. The man looks completely solid and real. And these visions, so to speak, began in 1967 after the chapter's secretary, Charles E. Sharp, passed away. Chris Sova, from before, has also seen Charlie, but only the lower half of his torso or a leg, not a full apparition. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just legs. Yep. He's also witnessed glowing balls of light, quote, zooming around the auditorium. There's a picture of Charlie from when he was alive. Thank you the for that clarification. Shop. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the barber shop in the auditorium and, and there are other things on pages 50 and 51 of the book, if you want to like zoom to that. And Sova's daughter has waved and said hello to empty air near a small door that leads to the pipe organ. One woman who works on the fifth floor of the building was told on her first day, quote, if you're here alone late at night and you hear something, just say hello to Charlie and everything will be just fine, end quote. And she has heard furniture moving on the floor below her and boxes rustling around her when she knows that she's alone, or she thinks she's alone. And the historic Masonic temple, which is connected, has paranormal activity also. Nick, I'm sorry, I tried to figure out how to pronounce your name and I couldn't. <laughs> Nick Suchita, sure. Um, director of Bay City's nonprofit Masonic Temple Preservation Group, plays music while working an overnight shift to drown out the male and female voices heard conversing all night. Holy crap! Okay, go on. He also he also reported locked doors unlocking themselves, and another member of the Joppa Lodge who used to clean the temple once witnessed quote a scene straight out of the 1930s play out before his very eyes end quote. He blinked and it was gone. While the most commonly reported figure is a well-dressed man, a 12-year-old girl with long black hair has been spotted, as well as an 8 to 12-year-old girl with blonde bobbed hair who wore a white dress, plaid skirt, long stockings, and Mary Jane shoes. Very descriptive. Uh -huh. An even younger girl with brown hair, a middle-aged cigar-smoking man, and a woman in a violet dress with long golden hair have also been seen. How loud do those voices have to be that you're like, man... I wish these ghosts would just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is the most active place we've we've yeah. reported on. This is what this like so many people have been seen. It's it's wild. Uh, the Michigan State University Paranormal Society investigated the old Masonic Temple in 2019. At the beginning of the investigation, one of the investigators thought she heard the other two in the basement. When she went down there and said she was going to turn off the lights, she heard an answering, okay. The other two investigators, however, were on the second floor on the at the time, not in the basement. They each experienced feeling frantic and like they shouldn't be there while in and around the old library. Batteries in the cameras quickly drained. They might have caught some EVPs with their cameras. You can watch their video on YouTube and judge for yourself. Yeah, one of them I definitely heard and one of them I was like, I what? Maybe if I had headphones on, I don't yeah, have to. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to try. I'll have to try with my fancy new headphones. I can hear so much more now. Yeah, definitely. Let me know if you hear <laughs> One of them I for sure heard, you know, even with my crappy headphones, I for sure heard. Um, and one of them I was like, I, there's nothing guys. I know you keep re repeating it, but I got nothing. <laughs> Look, um, but yeah, it's a cool video. You should this check it out. Is, yeah, no, this is, this place is hopping. Oh yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to see if we can go. Cause there are, a lot of it has not been touched and you will see that if you watch their video, but there are also, I don't want to say businesses because I think they're nonprofits, but okay. in, in, in the building, like on different floors. So you can get into some parts of it. They are still renovating it, however. Oh, okay. Okay. And I, I, I assume, you know, with the pandemic, it hasn't gotten much better. So, oh, I'm going to go with no. Yeah. Bay city is, is like a gold mine. It turned out. <laughs> it turns out, man. Yeah. I had no idea there was going to be this much when I first started doing that area. And I thought it was just going to be like Saginaw, Midland and Bay City all together. Right. They're known as like the, the three cities. So the Tri-City area. Yeah. yeah, but yeah no, yeah. I just honed in on Bay City and I have enough for two episodes at least. So. <laughs> man, Bay City, you're haunted. Yeah. We thought Marshall was haunted. I know. I I seriously think this vies for most haunted city in Michigan. We should have a contest. Yeah, we'll have a ghost off, a haunt off. 
Haunt off. Excellent. That sounds great. Okay. Since we've mentioned the Ann Arbor Library, how about we now talk about a library in Bay City? <gasps> oh, yes. Oh, yes, Michigals. We have a haunted library. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited. Thank you, Nicole Bolsham, for including this in your book, Haunted Bay City, Michigan. Kay, read to us from the Historic Sage Library's website. Um, gladly. The Sage Public Library, now known as the Sage Branch of the Bay County Library System, was dedicated to the people of West Bay City, Michigan in January 1884. It was a gift from Henry W. Sage, which now makes sense, of Ithaca, New York, who owned and operated one of the world's largest sawmills on the west side of the Saginaw River in Bay City. The library originally occupied the second floor with a reading room that was used by the Young Men's Debate Society. The first floor was used for school classes and the superintendent of schools had an office on the third floor. Historic features include a grand stairway from the lobby to the third floor, nice, and a large fireplace in, fr in the front reading room on the second floor. The fireplace has a massive wood mantle with a firebox opening surrounded by hand-painted ceramic tiles depicting figures from literary works and fairy tales. A portrait of Henry Sage hangs over the fireplace. So I have, we have to go to this library. Yes. In fact, um, I had shared something about it on Haunted Mittens social media, and we actually got someone commenting back saying that they love this library. Awesome. I don't even care if it's haunted. I'm just going to go sit in front of that fireplace. Yeah. So the Ann Arbor libraries are very modern. Yeah. Uh, I love them. They're very cool. There's some really neat architecture, but they are very modern. Yeah. Um, the downtown Ipsy one is, I'm guessing, historic, and it's, it's pretty cool but nothing like this yeah like, I've, I've seen sure. pictures of the outside and a little bit of the inside but it's it's very beautiful i'm excited to go visit a haunted library <gasps> me too Beauchamp says in her book that guests and employees have reported seeing a little girl on the third floor for over a hundred years this is it's way too many little girl ghosts by the way there are a lot of little this girl is ghosts. like number four and i'm not about it yeah she has a disfigured complexion and wears a white gown. Good God. Yeah. Quote, in a letter dated June 18th, 1901, received by the Library of West Bay City, Miss M.E. Ahern addresses the issue of a small child who died by contracting smallpox from a library book. Ahern goes on to say that she did what? not know. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> Ahern goes on to say that she did not know of any library that had a smallpox epidemic, but that she was quote again, very much grieved to hear of Little Miss Burns being a victim of dreadful malady, end quote, end quote. Okay, side note, <laughs> I find it terribly interesting because this was a concern in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we were wearing disposable gloves and quarantining returned books for three days for like most of last year. And library pages across the country were using products like Lysol, on the books they checked out and some people were actually cooking books in the microwave oh my god please don't do that i i know for the kent district library which serves grand rapids uh this was a big concern because they use metallic rfid tags which actually many libraries do and they burn when microwaved and could start a fire oh my god and they posted pictures of their books that had been microwaved on their social media so don't microwave your books, please. People. Dear God, don't microwave books. No, and it doesn't work anyway. <laughs> um, but whether or not you can catch a disease from a library book has actually been of public concern basically since the invention of public lending libraries. I find this very cool. I'm a nerd. Um, there's actually a very interesting article on the Smithsonian Magazine's website entitled, When the Public Feared That Library Books Could Spread Deadly Disease. And I will definitely be linking to that in the show notes. This letter that Beauchamp mentions would have been right around um, the, the thick of this discussion, actually. Um, as pe and people still debate it to some degree today, as, as we discovered last yep. year. During um, and, and Googling, can you get sick from library books, brings up tons of articles. Tons. But uh, to save you some time, the answer is unlikely. Yeah, so... Um please don't call your local library and ask questions of this nature because the answer is, yeah, probably not. You're, you're good. Yeah. I, good. I do know um, from our deputy director told us in one of our meetings and I did try to find the article 
but I, I couldn't, and perhaps it was just an inside librarian report that I believe it was the ALA um, did testing to see if you could contract COVID from books. And they did find that the virus can exist on the books, but it's so little that you basically can't contract it. Like okay. you would have to, I don't know, lick the book, rub your face all over it. Like, it's just, you would have to try extremely hard to get that virus to actually infect you. Oh my God, so, please don't lick library books. You're going to get don't, way don't worse. Do that either. <laughs> You're going to get way worse than COVID-19. Yeah, don't do that either. But yeah, the answer is unlikely. Uh, You're fine. You're safe. You can't get smallpox. You can't get COVID. You can't get oh my God. pneumonia. You're fine. Don't worry about it. Now back to ghosts. Okay. Beauchamp recounts the story of one library employee. Quote, I had just finished locking the front doors and was doing one more round in the building to make sure everything was in order when I heard what sounded like heavy boots stomping behind me. I checked everything out and I didn't see anyone. I was creeped out, but made it my goal to finish my work quickly so I could get out of there as soon as possible. When I descended the stairwell and got to the landing, I heard the thudding of the boots coming down the stairs after me. All I could do was freeze in terror and gaze upward at the upper levels, praying I wouldn't come face to face with whoever was making all that noise, end quote. Another employee said upon opening the library one morning, quote, some books were arranged in strange patterns and placed neatly across the room from where they should have been, while others were in disarray all over the floor as if they were caught in a windstorm, end quote. Yeah, speaking as a person who has often opened a library in the morning, this would piss me the hell off. You know, I'm not fully awake that early. Right. I'm not going to deal with these paranormal shenanigans. Like I'm, I'm getting some white sage, maybe some holy water, and I am exercising that spook. It's bad enough when living patrons put, put, pull these kinds of stunts. We don't need to add invisible beings to the mix. Okay. You hear that, ghost? None of it. I am having none of it. She will get rid of you. She will do it. I said it. good day, sir. <laughs> I said good day. On November 23rd, 2013, the Tri-City Ghost Hunter Society, which Beauchamp founded, actually, investigated the Sage Library branch. In her book, she says, quote, we were using an ovalis, uh, which is a spirit box, and it runs radio frequencies, basically, and really quick, uh, and really quickly, and it manifests voices, unquote, pause, because if that wasn't enough of an explanation, which I totally understand, um, it is a device that frequently scans uh, radio stations, and that includes radio stations that might just be white noise. And the thought is that it's easier, you just heard my cat, the thought is that it's easier for an entity to be able to use the words and the voices that are already coming through this fast scan of radio uh, signals in order to communicate with the living. I hope that helps. Requote, we kept getting the name Jacob and we got it from both a male and female spirit. We actually contacted the managing librarian who told us that in the past, there was a man named Jacob who actually had laid the flooring, unquote. She goes on to say that a few mediums who visited prior to TCGHS's investigation said that there was a man present who was, quote, particular about the carpet. Yeah, make that of what you will. <laughs> yeah. So at the start of this this part, I was like, oh, hell yeah, haunted library. And now I'm like, oh, dang it. I have way too much to do in the morning for you to leave me all these books on the floor. Yeah, yeah. As a, as a fellow library worker, my heart goes out to them. Right. But I'm also like, dude, haunted library. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I am very much like oh I would totally put up with all that junk just to like work in a super haunted library because I don't think any of ours are they're all they're too new um I don't know I mean they always talk about the mallets ghost and uh one full-timer who's been there for quite a while said very deadpan to me mallets is totally haunted that's true I actually oh. I've only been there like three months and I have heard that more than once yeah like people say that I've never felt that way but people who have been there longer than me are like convinced. Yeah. Like it's this big thing. Like when I started, they would always joke about the ballots ghost. And I was like, wait, are you guys for real? Cause I'm interested in that shit. <laughs> right. 
Like this isn't a joke to me. So I need you to be straight up. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but maybe, maybe we don't want it so haunted where we have to pick up books in the morning because a really bored ghost decided to make a pyramid. Yeah. I actually wrote a little, I had like this little four panel comic that I doodled and shared on our Patreon and it was inspired by this story. <laughs> so if you're on Patreon, go look at my ghost doodle. Oh, totally. I, I don't um, know if it'll be funny to anyone else, but it was hilarious to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, okay. So after this episode, I think it'll be now, now that we've done the episode, now you can go to our Patreon, which we're going to plug in a minute again anyway. So get used to us saying the word Patreon. Patreon. Um, I think it'll be funnier now. Yeah. That I know yeah. that I know what I'm talking about, that I know what, what you're talking about now. Yeah. I showed it to, <laughs> to Greg, who's my husband. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but, um, and I don't think he completely got it. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm like, eh, library humor. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You just don't get it, man. It's not cool like that. You're not cool like that, dude. <laughs> and that was just a taste of what Bay City has to offer. In our next episode, we will continue exploring Bay City with a look at the USS Edson, a former destroyer for the U.S. Navy, a couple of confectionery shops, which I hope still exist and we can go to, an antique store, a lighthouse, and more. Don't forget to like and review Haunted Mitten so more people find us. Follow us on all of the social medias at Haunted Mitten. All of the books we mentioned in the podcast are available at bookshop.org slash shop slash Haunted Mitten. If you are curious and would like to get your own copy, um, a lot of the books, in fact, like most of the books that we use are, um, are small and or local authors. So buy their stuff. And then if you buy through Bookshop, every purchase benefits this podcast as well as the independent bookstore of your choice. And of course, the authors whom I just mentioned, most of whom are fellow Michiganders. It is a win, win, win. You cannot lose with this people. Do it. Buy books. And the books aren't that expensive either. And some of them uh, I know right now are on sale. <gasps> Great. So, yeah. Bookshop.org slash shop slash haunted mitten. Cool. I'm going to go buy some books that I don't, we've already used and I don't need, but want. there are two, I think that aren't on there because they are very extremely, totally out of print. So <laughs> that's when our wonderful library comes into play. Yep. Yep. That's when you go to the <laughs> library. Haunted Bridges, I think is one of them. That's Oof, that was actually okay. published by Llewellyn, which I know, you know, who Llewellyn is. Yep. Um, and that's actually available online to read in full for free. Oh, okay. So it's no longer on Bookshop because Llewellyn is like, no, nope, we're not selling it here. You can just read the whole thing for free or you can get it from the library because I checked that out for someone recently. <laughs> so you can get it for free or for free. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but yeah, as we do these episodes, I will be adding more, more to the list, but no spoilers. They don't get added until I've used them up. So we are also on Patreon, as Woo! we said. Patreon. One dollar a month gets you access to the private Haunted Mitten Discord server, as well as exclusive Patreon content like my awesome comic doodles, and <laughs> including the audio recording of our very first live presentation at Frankenfest Detroit about historic Fort Wayne. Woo! A million a live show. Yes, a million thanks to Jerry for recording that for us, as well as inviting yes. us. Yes, like, thank you, Jerry. You, Ger Jerry and Krista, not this Krista. His sister, Krista, are great people. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, Frankie Fest actually just started this year. There was one held in Lansing at the Turner Dodge House, which we talked about in our Lansing episode. And then this second event was at Historic Fort Wayne, as I oh, said. it was so good. It was so good. Both events were amazing. And it was so much fun to actually be a part of this one. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where this goes. They were so, like, they were such great hosts, all of the people that were involved. And it was huge. Fort Wayne oh, was, was even so bigger huge. than huge. Yeah, so yeah and look, it, look it for them felt, next year. Yes, it feels like Halloween. So every good feeling that you have about being a kid at Halloween and like watching fun Halloween movies and thinking like, man, that just looks like a really fun time. That's what Frankenfest is. It's not about like horror and gore and like 
Friday the 13th and all that stuff. It's it's just about like the joy and the spookiness that is Halloween. Yeah, it's family friendly. Because like, yeah. when I was telling people about it before we did the Detroit one, um, I said, well, it's it's a family friendly horror festival. And, and you could see their brains go, does not compute. <laughs> yeah. Because a family friendly horror, horror is not family friendly. Well, I mean, it can be. There are so many Disney movies, spooky Disney movies. Yeah, I mean, Halloween is yeah. what they, not just for kids, but it's very much a kid-centric holiday nowadays. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you could absolutely, absolutely bring your children to this. Oh, 100%. We were across from this amazing group that did a bunch of Monsters, Inc. cosplay. And I mean, like, 10-foot tall Monsters, Inc. full fur, full movement cosplay. Yeah. And they had the door that you could, like, pose with. There's a lot of kids posing next to the door. It was actually um, really cute. Yeah, it was. It was really great. And then outside they had all of these cars and, and vans and things done up like movie sets, cars. So there's like the Ghostbusters were out there. Yeah, there was Ecto um, 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and there were a couple like vintage cars that were just done up in like old timey Halloween decorations. Yeah. And, and I know and it, then, like it, um, Lansing, they also had the Jurassic Park van as well oh, as a giant yeah. dinosaur yeah um and then the scooby van oh that's right yeah the mystery machine Yep. um and then all of the vendors were amazing artists in their own right all different kinds of art too it was everything just... from soap to stained glass yeah and i got <laughs> some soap the soap is called rose from the dead from bathomet <laughs> which is like the greatest soap company ever just the name i love you chef's kiss I love it. Um, yeah, and I've I've blogged about both these events too, so you can see those on my blog. Yes. Which is life from A2, letter A, number two, dot blogspot.com. You can also just Google me and it'll pop up. Uh and then you can also email us, and I'm being made to say this again. I can't <laughs> I can't say these words correctly. Um, email us at contact haunted mitten at gmail.com if you have a story or want to get in contact about a collaboration or like you have an event you think would be, we would be good at um we are uh, um, actually this is season three for us now we would like to start doing sponsors and ads so especially if you have like a small business and you have like a bit of money you know you want to get your advertising out there let us know. Send us an email. Find us on, on the social medias. We would love to work with you. Absolutely. Yeah. As for me, Kay, you can find me on pretty much all the social medias. I don't really use Facebook. When it was down, I was like rejoicing. But you can find me at K, just the letter K, Gray, G-R-A-Y, writes, W-R-I-T-E-S. So at K Gray writes, and that's pretty much everywhere. Yep. And you can find me, Krista, at Krista K. Coburn. I'll spell it for you. C-R-Y-S-T-A-K-C-O-B-U-R-N. Why do you have a hard name and why did I pick a word that can be spelled multiple ways? I blame my parents for that. Like, I do too. That's I fine. I blame me for mine. <laughs> blame slash thank? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, uh, you know, thanks for the cool, super hard to spell name, parents. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And as always, happy haunting.